Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafferke, and I've been getting the question a lot lately about what has changed in Databricks and Apache Spark since I put the series together on YouTube. So this video is to review the things that have changed or been added to Databricks since the series which was originally uploaded. Spoiler alert, not too many changes, but a lot of new things. So where are we going? I want to start off by being clear about what I'm trying to do here. My Master Databricks and Apache Spark series had 39 videos, I believe. It's a lot of content. At the time when I did those videos, a lot of things were either in development or on the future roadmap, but not in GA yet. One of the big ones was something called Data Lakehouse. That was definitely on the horizon, but since it wasn't in GA, I did not include it in my book and I did not include it in the series. Now that's not really a problem because everything I cover in the series is still relevant and you do need it as a foundation to adopt and learn about the additional more advanced services. So I'll talk about that a little bit. The most important change I think especially related to my series is that the data lake concept was a read-only paradigm. What do you mean by that Brian? Well, when we think about data warehouses in a relational database world, we think about maintaining tables. Changes come in, inserts, updates, delete, and we have to keep applying that to keep our tables up to date. It may be a surprise to you, but only a few years ago, Apache Spark didn't actually support that kind of operation. Data lakes were read only. And when I talk in my series about schema on read, which is when you define the metadata the schema of what is in say a CSV file or a JSON file or something like that you're just reading it but you give the information about it to the SQL engine so that it can allow you to do SQL statements and do all kinds of selects and all kinds of other things what you will notice is I don't talk about doing updates or inserts in my series and that's because it wasn't supported until we get to Delta Lake or Delta Tables and I'm going to talk more about that where am I going I'm going to talk about how Databricks has not stood still and a quick list of additions and changes to Databricks that I'm going to talk about a little more detail in another video but I'll give you a list here and then we'll wrap things up so Databricks has not stood still the good news about Databricks one of the things I really like is they generally will add new things sometimes entirely new services like Unity Catalog, or they'll enhance existing services like notebooks or workflows. I can't think of any cases where they've just eliminated something that was part of the Databricks services. So if you do put it in the comments, but I can't think of any, and certainly nothing that I've covered in my series, which means my series videos are still relevant, yay me, <laughs> and I don't have to go back and redo them all. But I have added a lot of new videos that you may not have seen if you've only done the series that talk about some of the newer services and concepts. So let's talk about those additional services and features. Clearly, across the world, the most important thing everybody's talking about is artificial intelligence, and Databricks has always been a first-class platform for machine learning and AI. But when this explosion of AI happened recently, they went out and started investing in companies, the most important of which is a company called Mosaic AI. And they now have a Mosaic AI service to give you all kinds of awesome services around training and delivering AI models. Another service added is scaled out, fully maintained data warehouses, AKA Lakehouse. To understand this, think of a data lake, and the idea is you just dump a lot of files in there, doesn't matter how big, but whatever your files are, you slice and dice and you query the data, but you're not maintaining the data. You're not doing inserts, updates, and deletes. And in that sense, you do not have the equivalent of a data warehouse. Databricks came around and said, hey, we need that. So they created a new paradigm and the technology to support it called a lake house, combining the idea of a data lake with a warehouse, data lake house. The core technology under that is called Delta Tables, and sometimes people say Delta Lake. It all comes down to the same thing, though, and that's what they call the lake house. In many organizations, there's a need to create any number of Databricks workspaces. And sometimes companies will divide the workspaces by applications. So you can imagine finance and sales and marketing and accounting. And then within those functional areas, they may also have workspaces separated from dev to testing to QA to production. So you can imagine how many workspaces you could end up proliferating. Now the problem is 
Workspaces in Databricks until recently were all very isolated, little worlds of their own, and that made it a challenge for central visibility, administration, and governance, including security. That was solved in UC, which is Unity Catalog. Unity Catalog provides one pane of glass in which you can administer, secure, and govern all of your workspaces. Something I also have not done a video on yet, but I need to, is something called SQL Endpoints, recently renamed to SQL Warehouse. What's that about, Brian? What's the point of that? We've always had SQL, right? Yes, but I think the real point of SQL Endpoints or SQL Warehouse is really to respond to Snowflake. Snowflake's strong point is you get in and you can just use SQL. You don't even have to think about your clusters. You don't have to worry about spinning up resources. It just works. And that's really what SQL Endpoints are about. You can go in. It only supports SQL. Within that, analysts can go in and they can just start querying and doing work and they don't have to think about creating clusters or managing them. It just works. An issue on all data platforms, so of course Databricks is no exception, is always performance. No matter how fast it is, it's never fast enough. That's just the nature of data platforms. And in this regard, Databricks has made two really important advancements. One is called AQE. AQE stands for Adaptive Query Execution, and as the name implies, it adapts. What happens is when the query is running, as it learns information, learns, for instance, how many rows there are, all the different metrics and attributes about the data, which can happen after the first shuffle, for instance, Databricks reanalyzes its execution plan and then changes it to be more optimal based on what it now knows. So it's improving the execution as it goes. It's a huge advancement and it's very interesting to watch because you can actually see it as the query is executing, how it's reevaluating and changing things. For instance, it might not know that one table in a join is actually really small. So it may decide in a step below where it's just determined that, that it could just do a broadcast. So it will broadcast the data. There's any number of things it could do, but that's just one small example of how it could really massively improve performance and you don't have to do anything for it. It just works like magic. Nice thing about AQE is it's also available in Apache Spark. Now Photon is a real game changer and a direction changer in many ways in terms of Spark because Photon is a rewrite of the Spark execution engine in C++. Wait a minute, Brian, isn't everything in Spark written in Scala? Well, it was, but with Photon, that's changing. And a lot of the execution engine has already been done. Now, the nice thing is C++ is really fast, and it breaks all of the limitations that were forced on Spark due to the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. So Photon is a game changer. Currently, it is only available in Databricks. I assume down the road that will have to change because if eventually Photon rewrites all of the Spark engine, well, it's going to make sense that if they want it to stay as an open source project, they'll probably push it in somehow into Spark. That's my thought. I don't know. Anyway, Photon is really good and it can improve performance by orders of magnitude. Workflows and notebooks have also had a lot of improvement. When I started using workflows way back, all you could really do was just run a notebook. That was it. It didn't allow for job flows. It didn't have any conditionals. One job couldn't call another. It was very, very basic. But now you have a really powerful data workflow execution ETL process service available to you. And I think it supports many, if not most, needs. Definitely always look at workflows before you start using any third-party tools. And that includes things like Azure Data Factory. Notebook improvements is another area. I'm very re resistant to change. I don't like to see anything new in my coding tools. But I have to say the things they've done in the notebooks is really a big improvement. Lots of great things. It's It looks slicker now. I was playing with it the other day and I was really impressed just looking at the notebooks and how much nicer and more advanced they look than they did just a few years ago. So kudos to them for doing that. It's not something they get a lot of PR over, but it's really important. And of course, a big area here is the Databricks Assistant, which is an AI tool. Think of what, you know, Copilot is doing with Microsoft products. Same kind of idea in Databricks, and you can get help with your coding. One other thing to mention is also along notebooks and workflows, Databricks has improved greatly the support for dashboards and the ability to use dashboards to be a truly first-class service within Databricks. Other important improvements are many. And when I get to a video talking more about this, I'll, I'll probably add some things. But two big things that stand out are Databricks Asset Bundles, which is data ops, a way to migrate and deploy your projects from one environment to another in Databricks, and the REST API. 
technically it's not new, but because of all these other services, the REST API has been expanded to support all of these things like Unity Catalog and the new features in the notebooks and workflows. Very cool. And the beauty of the REST API, which I haven't really done a video on, I've worked a lot with it, is that almost everything is covered by the REST API. And the REST API allows you to outside of the Databricks environment or even within it, to make calls to do things like generate a job, create a notebook, dynamically encode. And I've done a lot of that. It's very cool and it works really well. And the REST API is actually what the Databricks asset bundles and even the Databricks Python SDK leverage under the covers. So it's kind of their backbone. So wrapping up, very short video. The point is that Databricks has not stood still, but fortunately we haven't lost any relevancy in the series as it has been delivered here because the things that Databricks has done has been additive and expansive and not taking things away. The additions and changes that I did list about Databricks were many, but the three big takeaways I want to leave you with is Lakehouse was extensively important. Lakehouse was a game changer and everything has shifted since then to be able to support truly scaled out data warehouses on Databricks. Unity Catalog is another game changer because it allows us to govern, manage, and secure our assets across our enterprise. And now the workspaces are all unified. And finally, artificial intelligence AI is definitely pivotal and Databricks is in the best position I think of any company out there to enable companies to jump in and get value out of AI. And that's it for this time. I want to thank you, share, subscribe. Until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.